नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत संबुद्ध लास्ट वीक वी मेंशन दिस इज ए सीरीज ऑन द फैक्टर्स ऑफ एनलाइटनमेंट द रिक्विजिट्स ऑफ एनलाइटनमेंट बोध ही पख्या धम्म दैट मीन्स दो फैक्टर्स विच कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट towards enlightenment and uh, they lead to enlightenment and the development of these factors is, is the uh, purpose of spiritual life so last week we mentioned about we, we gave a simile uh, to illustrate how these bodhi uh, pakya dhammas are to be cultivated we the first simile was on the royal dana the dana given by the king uh, just uh, i had also mentioned that if you all those who are here who have been listening if you can recall this it will make matters very easy we can uh, go forward rather fast uh, i will Uh, briefly recall anyway so now the king of the country heard that a group of arhats were staying in a uh, in a in a sort of uh, retreat a jungle retreat with a uh, rocky mountain in the middle of it uh, a mom this the forest area was very beautiful there was a river all around that uh, hilly that hill ra- range of hill and not very far from the uh, you see the villages there are many many villages all around and people had great reverence for these yogi monks and uh, so the king heard and he declared the area to be a migadaya that means a um, a sanctuary for wild life so it was indeed a very peaceful and very calm and silent place where people used to visit the saints and receive their blessings so king decided also on the uh, on a you see on the full moon day of july that is the varshavas had the rains retreat that he would like to offer a dana an alms uh, offering uh, to all the arhats who lived in that place for that particular rainy season and uh, so he uh, sent his ministers beforehand and invited them uh, the arhats and they agreed so on that uh, on the day of on the full moon day the king had already uh, You see, he had established some kind of a tent village. There is a camp consisting of all kinds of structures, all tents, and some. Uh, you see, there are two main buildings: one of the dining dana sala, and the other the dhamma hearing, the, the dhamma sala. So these monks arrived on that day. exactly at 6 am in the morning as usual for their morning pratarasa that is the morning arms round and they received uh, kanji and uh, some liquid food and uh, some other eatables and that was their breakfast so as usual the monks came and all in one line and people from all the surrounding villages and the king had come with a big gratitude of his officials and others and the citizens too had flocked there so the monks were received with great reverence and they were offered with the with the kanji breakfast they had it then uh, they went and sat down in the from the dining uh, sala or the hall 
to the Dhamma hall where they, have, uh, they were supposed to hear the Dhamma. They gave the discourses and the others listened to the discourses. So now, uh, on that first day, the four arhats were chosen to give uh, discourse, di uh, discourses, the topic being mindfulness as the source of emancipation. We had, if you remember, we had defined what exactly is meant by bodhi, enlightenment. The subject in this series is bodhi, pakhya, dhamma. The factors which lead to the attainment of uh, bodhi, enlightenment, which simply means a state of emancipation. There are two concepts which I mentioned last time. One is the concept of emancipation. The other is the concept of being awakened, waking up into the reality from a state of delusion and mental darkness, ignorance. So, this theme, uh, you see, this emancipation to achieve in its very perfect form, in the ultimate form leading to liberation from uh, samsaric existence, the worldly existence. One has to cultivate those factors which, when perfected, brought about uh, emancipation, that is to say, enlightenment. So the emancipation idea, last time we mentioned, that of the American blacks, they were all slaves. They were in a terrible, terrible condition indeed, and uh, beaten and hanged, and for the slightest thing, tortured, and uh, awful state. Then they were emancipated by Abraham Lincoln, and that became, uh, you see, high point in American, the unfoldment of American democracy and uh, the uh, economic progress, etc. Now, just imagine after em uh, emancipation, how they have gone through the process of emancipation. It was a process. It was suddenly, it was not that suddenly they all became free and uh, they became equal. Uh, to the the others, that is the whites and so on. No, they were under a lot of restrictions for a long time indeed. But after the Second World War, around about there, you see, they had their uh, emancipation in a very, uh, in a very very visible, evident way. So today they have a black precedent. The emancipation has led to that, from the state of a slave to the state of a president of this country. So liberation or emancipation simply means that a complete transformation of a society, of a people, of a polity, of an economic system, a whole range of a civilization as such. Now, if you extrapolate this idea to the uh, to spirituality, to the field of spirituality, emancipation simply means the being freed from the state of bondage, bond. You see, to be bonded, to be bound or uh, fettered. The jail birds are all fettered. All the prisoners are fettered in prison in prisons. They are fettered and bound and tortured and all that. Once they are emancipated from the jail, they are freed from all those. And they enjoy freedom in a way that they, you see, they can achieve happiness 
and uh, all the attributes of civilized life. Now, this emancipation is something that has to be felt moment to moment. So, now to give you an example, the word uh, bondage or fetter is known as sangyojana. See, sangyojana is a technical term in Buddhism and very, very important term in it. And there are ten such fetters that bind us in samsaric existence. And when we are able to break asunder these bondages, these fetters, it is then that the mind gets fully transformed and one becomes enlightened liberated from the wheel of being born again and again, dying again and again, and being reborn again and again, ad infinitum, endlessly. Now the idea of samsara is just that, to be born again and again, die again and again, being reborn again and so on. So this whole process of bondage, that worldly existence as such, brings about. The end of it is spiritual emancipation. Now, how the bondage occurs, it is, uh, it is something that every spiritual seeker should understand. It is said, Sangyo Janam Iti Sangyo Jeti Anto Ajhattikam Ajhattikam Bahirikena Sangyojeti. That means our inner world, which is the world of the mind, gets interlocked with the external world. And this interlocking of the uh, external and the internal world brings about uh, the question of you see, you like an object, or you dislike, or you are neutral and the mind gets activated and then ultimately gets a whole, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, a whole series of mental activities. It's uh, a kind of chain reaction that occurs. Uh, one triggers the other and so on, and one gets in a state of mental bondage. How it happens is very simple. Now, for instance, the, six, uh, the five senses, eye, ear, nose, etc., they are all the senses, sensory world, which are a part of the body, our, uh, you see, ultimately, if you look at life, you see, it uh, ends up as nothing but nama rupa, mind-body combination, psycho-physical combination. That is what we are. Ultimately, the name that we give, all kinds of uh, things that we are open, we put on ourselves, are just conventional uh, means of organizing a conventional way of living. So otherwise, from the ultimate standpoint, you see, if you say who a man or a woman is, it's just nothing but mind and matter. Nothing but name, uh, you see, Nama simply means the world of mind and Rupa, the mind, uh, the world of matter or uh, physical world, body. So now, being equipped with all these senses and the, which also form the base for our consciousness, you see. So, the eye you, see, you have an eye, you are equipped with the eye, therefore automatically you see things. You see of visible objects and when you uh, see a visible object, you like it. And if you like it, you desire it. If you don't like it, you are repelled from it, so you want to get rid of it. That also is a kind of desire to get rid of. So desire, 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 that's what this interaction brings about, and desire grows into craving, and craving grows into attachment. 
what you crave that you cling to. When you keep on craving, you keep on clinging to what you crave. And by clinging you develop attachment. And once the attachments are developed, that is it. That is where the mind, you see, these attachments trigger a process of karmic activity. You commit a particular karma. So, the, the desire or the craving is a mental pollutant. It pollutes the mind and thereby makes the mind weak, debilitated and distorted, is unable to see what the reality is. So with craving grows, uh, goes ignorance or delusion. So craving and delusion go together, or ignorance. You can't separate them. And this is how karma is committed, and you keep on. A karma means an action in three ways, bodily, verbal, and mental. And an action is something that has the potency or the power or capacity to produce a result which is uh, compatible to itself. So now, if you commit, uh, say, a, uh, an action like punching somebody's nose, you get back another punch on your nose. That is what it is. You invite that. If you do something evil, you also get pain, suffering because of that. If you do something good, you also, as a result of that, you, are, you also become happy, peaceful, and progress, prosperity, all these things. So good and bad actions ultimately, you see, determine our destiny. What we will be in future will be decided by how we live now. And this how we live now simply means how we act now. Ultimately, uh, life is uh, reducible to just one, one factor. That is the action, the fact of being involved in an act. You act in some way or other, either bodily or verbally, speak, or think. If you don't speak, if you don't act, at least your mind is active, it's all the time working. You can't stop the mind working. I'm, uh, uh, you see, stop it work. It works. So now these threefold activities or actions, when they are uh, based on will or volition or intention, they are a very, very powerful action indeed which form the ingredient of our future existence, of our destiny. So, due to these interactions between the senses and the external objects, which drag the mind therewith, the mind gets dragged along with this, as soon as the contact between the two occurs and the interlocking occurs, the mind gets dragged. So the internal world of mind and the external world, they get interlocked. And all kinds of, and this process, this brings about a kind of whole chain reaction and series of activities and leading to karma. And once you are involved in karma in action, the result of it will have to be experienced. And some results are experienced here and now in this very life. Some are experienced in the next, or the next, or the next. So, you see, this is the course of life. So, bondage therefore means this bonding of the mind with the external world. So, you become aware of the external world. And if this awareness is a distorted one, then only all the wrong types of activities follow, wrong uh, unwholesome karmas are committed, and you get uh, in the samsaric existence ad infinitum, endlessly.
come and go, come and go, come and go and die. That's it. That's the story. So now, this bondage to be free, emancipated, therefore, what need, what needs to be done is cultivate mindfulness. Mindfulness is just the ability to attend one thing at a time. That is, focus the mind on one thing at a time and be clearly aware and alert of jagriti. Be mentally uh, awake and alert about that particular transaction which is called, uh, the transaction called being mindful, being attentive, being heedful. So when you are attentive mentally, this attentiveness is mindfulness. You are mindful of it, so your mind is fully aware of this. And it is this which is the tool, the primary tool for bringing about freedom, emancipation from this bondage, which goes on from moment to moment till we live. The whole life is just that. At the end of life, due to this interlocking, bonding of the internal and the external world, at the end of life, when you have to face the critical moment of death, at that time what happens? You see, the, at the last thought, which determines the next first thought of the next, uh, next, uh, next life, so in the last thought is based upon some object which is received from any one of these five senses or the mind. Mind is also a sense, a mental sense, and is far more complex and far more, uh, you see, vast in range, and very comprehensive indeed. What you see, after seeing, you may forget about it, but then you remember it with the mind. It becomes an object of the mind. And uh, you relive it. Relive that experience again and the same karmic process goes on again and you keep on accumulating karmic uh, potencies in this way. That is how the, the bondage occurs from moment to moment and at the end, the last thought moment which has a certain uh, image again, mental image, as the object of the mental sense, that triggers into the next uh, moment is the rebirth consciousness. So that triggers the rebirth consciousness. And uh, rebirth consciousness determines the next life. What you are going to be in the future, uh, that the rebirth consciousness, the first consciousness, will determine that. Your whole course of existence in the next life will be determined by that first consciousness, rebirth consciousness. Now, so that also is another meaning of the word bond. Bondage or sangyojanam. Sang plus yojanam that which fetters.